Hello and welcome to our webinar, Key Building Pressure Measurement Applications. I'm Bill Graber. I'm in the TEC Sales and Marketing Department. I've been with TEC about one year after spending 27 years at Emerson in measurement instrumentation. Also presenting today is Paul Morin. He's our TEC Technical Support Leader. Paul has a wealth of experience in building diagnostics uh, at TEC. CEE, also here in Minneapolis, and is a former president of the Minnesota BPA. Uh, today's webinar counts for one CEU uh, with BPI, so uh, do supply your BPI number to get some credit there. And the big news for us today is the introduction of our new DG8 micromanometer. This is a single channel pressure measurement device. Uh, we're pretty excited about it, and many of the applications Paul will take you through um, will be suitable for this in addition to our existing gauges, the DG700 and the DG1000. So just a quick reminder of who we are, uh, TEC, the Energy Conservatory, our mission is to develop robust air measurement tools and processes, which are used to help uh, improve built environments. We're 100% USA owned, the only uh, blower door company that is. And you probably know us for our products, the Minneapolis Blower Door, the Minneapolis Duck Blaster, the DG1000, DG700, TrueFlow, and the software we make uh, that works with those products. And as I said today, uh, the big news for us is the introduction of this new DG8. So I'll give you a brief overview and then Paul will step us through eight different applications uh, that this product can be used in. So this is uh, intended to be a much more cost effective product than our current um, DG1000. So the DG1000 is a pressure end flow device uh, intended to um, control a blower door or a duct blaster. The DG8 is just a single channel pressure measurement. Um, and so as a result, we can make it much more uh, cost effective and the list price of this you can see is $549 US. This just shows you a quick comparison of the two gauges. Uh, I've already stated the big difference is that the DG1000 is intended to be used with blower doors and duct blasters. The DG8 is not designed for that application. It does not do uh, any of the flow calculations. It is a pressure device. But there are many room pressure and zonal pressures that you will, will make. Uh, if you're in uh, the radon industry and you're a professional there, uh, this gauge will meet a lot of those types of applications. And so that's what we'll talk about today. Here's a, a little bit um, better view of the product. And what you can see is it's pretty straightforward. Now, different than the DG1000, this gauge uh, it does not have a computer on board. It, it does not support any apps. It is not a touch screen um, like your phone. This has a just a simple two button control and a simple but fairly large color display. And so the power button is on the left and then there's other controls on the right. That controls what units you're gonna see, uh, Pascals or inches H2O. Uh, and then the other thing that's worth noting is that there is a Bluetooth capability and this product connects to the tech gauge app uh, but currently no others okay this gives you a little view of the other sides on the top you can see there's a USB-C charger port it does come with a charger that does uh, a quick charge and then there's two indicator lights next to it that will show you that you're connected to power supply and also that you're charging on also on the top is a fan control jack that is there for future use uh, not really an application for that um, out of the blocks. And then on the back of the DG8 are um, mounting magnets. Uh, and just like a DG1000, uh, if you have a pacemaker, that's something to be uh, aware of. Okay, so this is the last comparison slide, but it, it touches on uh, quite a few different specific features. On the far left, this column here, shows you the main, uh, you know, what are people looking for that are using our gauges? Obviously price is important, accurate readings, how easy is it to use and where should I use it? What applications? And then here's a comparison between the two. 
with some notes out there on the far right, which explain mostly what's different about the DG8. Uh, but what you can see here, the list price is dramatically lower, almost one third the price um, of a, a DG1000. Uh, the key being that it's pressure only, not flow. Same accuracy though, so it measures that pressure with blower door style manometer accuracy. The other uh, key uh, is that the DG8 does not have any of the apps on board and does not connect to many of the TEC apps. It does not have a high resolution touch screen like an iPhone, um, which the DG1000 does have. But it does have Bluetooth communication and initially it will communicate to the Tech Gauge app. Both have the magnets I've already highlighted. The DG1000 is really designed for all of the blower door and duct blaster two channel flow and pressure. Um, applications. The DG8 is not, but when you get into um, pressure measurements like room pressures in uh, a combustion appliance zone or in a hospital, um, radon testing, zonal pressure diagnostics, now uh, the DG8 becomes a very good cost-effective option, but if you already have a DG1000, then you're probably doing many of those measurements today with a DG1000. Okay, so these uh, are the list uh, of applications and then I'm gonna hand it off to Paul. Here you can see on the right, the picture of the DG8 kit. So when you uh, purchase one, what will you get? You'll get the gauge itself. You'll get two carrying cases, a small one that's just for the DG8. And then that case will go into a larger bag, which will also include a static pressure probe, two coils of tubing, the USB-C quick charger, and then some decals if you're making any holes in a ductwork or an air handler to um, plug that hole. And um, you can see also some pictures of it being used with a pressure pan and an exhaust fan flow meter. Again, today, Paul will take you through eight different applications and we'll be highlighting the DG8, but many of these applications, in fact, all of these applications can be made using a DG700 or DG1000 as well. So I'll turn it over to Paul. We'll be covering a number of pressure measurement applications, including room pressures, draft of natural draft appliances, house depressurization, sub slab pressures, static pressures of HVAC systems, pressure pan measurements, zonal pressures, and the exhaust fan flow meter. We'll be using differential pressure gauges, which um, allow us to measure pressure differences between two locations. And the first gauges that were used were uh, for, for blower door testing were dial gauges. And, and the dial gauges will only move in one direction. Um, so they need to see a positive pressure in order to read. So the, the taps were labeled plus and minus. So if uh, plus is on the top and minus is on the bottom. And if you thought what you were measuring would be a positive pressure, you would connect the tube to the top of whatever you're measuring. And if you thought it was going to be a negative pressure, you would, you would um, um, connect it to the bottom. That way, in either case, the dial would move in the, in the right direction. When we move to digital gauges, um, we kept the orientation the same, so plus was on the top, minus was on the bottom, but we labeled them input and reference because now we could read either positive or negative pressures. And so, so what we would connect to the input tap is the object that we're measuring, for example, house, and then the reference would be the outside. So the terminology became with reference to, so house with reference to outside. When we moved to the DG1000 and the DG8, the, the orientation was, was left right with the taps instead of top bottom. So plus, minus, plus, minus. And with the DG8, we also changed the, the tap terminology back to plus, minus instead of input reference because more um, HVAC contractors who are used to that plus minus orientation going back to the dial days uh, would be using the gauge also. 
So the first application we'll cover is room pressures, um, residential air handlers, which would include furnace fans, air conditioner fans, heat pump fans, can move from 500 to 2000 CFM of air. Um, so pretty powerful fans. And this the pressure imbalance is caused by this air handler can drive infilt house infiltration or exfiltration due to duct leaks and door closures. And in, in some cases, um, in some homes, in some climates, that can be the, the primary driver of infiltration and exfiltration. And so these pressure differences definitely can affect energy use. They can affect indoor air quality if the house is under a negative pressure, so it's causing uh, radon gases uh, to come in the house or um, com combustion gases from natural draft appliances to be coming in the house. It can definitely affect comfort and building durability through moisture and condensation. So if you've got a wet crawl space and it's pulling that moisture um, up from the crawl space or if you have moisture from the house being driven into a cold attic space, you can get condensation and mold uh, leading to rot and building durability issues. Um, so we'll start with uh, room pressures. And um, first we'll set up the house in, in blower door test conditions. And we'll, we'll be measuring um, house with respect to outside. So house is on the left and outside is on the right. So we'll need it. Uh, the tube is in the house, so we don't need a, uh, um, the uh, tap is in the house, so we don't need a, a tube on, on that side, and we'll just need to run a tube to the outside. So these tests will look at how the air handler affects pressures in the whole house with reference to outside. Each of these tests, you'll need to write down a, an initial baseline reading and compare that to, to pressures with the air handler on. So we're looking at the change in pressure caused by the air handler running and the effect of that pressure on the whole house. So the first one will be a dominant duct leakage test. So this, this is, is to see if, if the just turning the air handler on is going to cause changes in pressures in the house that are significant enough to be causing additional infiltration and exfiltration. So additional energy penalties on top of just the duct leakage penalties. Um, so we'll turn it on. It could go positive or negative, depending on if the supplier return side are, are dominant. But we're, we're, um, we're just trying to see if, if that pressure is greater than one Pascal. And if it is, it's significant enough to um, to make some changes just based on the extra infiltration exfiltration that occurs when the air handler is running. Um, with this next test, we'll close we'll close um, one of the doors in the house, whichever one we suspect might be the biggest issue. And usually, it would be a bedroom door that has two supplies and no return would would affect um, the pressure in the whole house the most. So now we're still measuring the main body of the house with respect to outside, and we're gonna close a bedroom door or maybe a bathroom door. And if that changes the, the pressure in the house by more than a Pascal, then, then we will make changes. So air handler is running and, and we're closing a door and measuring the pressure in the main body of the house with reference to outside. And then we'll, we'll close all of the interior doors. And we want that pressure to be less than two pascals. If it's more than two pascals, house main body of the house with reference to outside, then we'll want to um, make do some remediation to, to solve those problems. Um, the next test we'll be doing we'll be doing is measure measuring individual room pressures with reference to the house. So now we're measuring the room with reference to the house. So left side is the room, right side is the house. So um, we'll start with all the doors open and we'll check the rooms one at a time. So we'll, we'll put a tube in a room, close the door, measure the pressure, 
then open the door, move to the next room, um, throw the tube in that room, close that door, etc. And um, if that pressure is less than three, then we're okay. If that pressure is greater than three, we're going to re want to relieve uh, the pressure in those in those rooms. We've been getting certainly more more phone calls from uh, from hospitals asking about pressure gauges um, with, with COVID-19. And if, if the people in the room have immune de deficiencies, so their, their immune systems are depressed, um, they, they need to be kept from any other uh, diseases in the hospital for sure. So, so those rooms will be kept at a positive pressure. So, so all of the air is, is, uh, from that room is leaving the room um, the rooms are being pressurized with clean air to keep um, to keep air um, um, from the rest of the hospital to them. If if you have infectious diseases such as is COVID nineteen that's infectious, you'll want the opposite. You want to maintain negative pressures in the room, and um, so we'll be measuring the room with respect to the corridor, room on the left, corridor on the right. We'll run a tube to the corridor and measure those pressures. The next application is draft pressures of natural draft appliances. And a natural draft appliance is one that relies on the buoyancy of air for air to vent up the chimney. And you'll be able to put your hand up in the draft hood of a natural draft appliance and feel the exhaust going up the chimney. And a negative draft pressure indicates that the flow uh, of the exhaust is flowing up the chimney. So you're using the draft pressure as an indicator of the direction of the flow. Um, but also checking for combustion spillage is recommended because you could potentially have a strong draft pressure and spillage occurring at the same time. And an example of that would be if you have a large water heater, say a 75,000 BTU water heater, and it has a three inch vent pipe, you'll have a very strong draft pressure. It'll indicate that You've got a lot of um, a good strong draft of air going up the chimney, but a, a, a 75,000 BTU water heater should have a five inch vent and it's only has a three. So it'll be spilling combustion appliances into the house also. Um, so you wanna, you wanna make sure and, and check for spillage with a smoke puffer or, or the back of your hand or uh, fogging up a mirror or, a, you know, you've got a, a, um, a mirror uh, fogging that up is also an indicator of, uh, of combustion spillage. And you would measure the pressure in a long section, longest section of, of uh, piping, and away from elbows or restrictions, and a downstream elbow will have a bigger effect on, on the turbulence in the pipe than an upstream. So you want to you wanna be about two-thirds of the way upstream from, from an elbow uh, to the next obstruction in a straight piece of pipe. Uh, for where you want to measure that draft. And, and again, draft is just an indicator. It's not a pass-fail criteria. If it, um, you always want to check for spillage. And, and this is, is a chart that uh, has been in our, our blow door manual for years. It was developed by the Center for Energy and Environment in, in a sound insulation program there where they did they did a monitoring of, of thousands of homes and came up with this scale for uh, for what you should expect draft pressure to be. So depending on temperature. So, you know, if you're at 70 degrees, it should be about one Pascal. And, and it's a floating scale where draft pressure gets higher um, as pressures get colder, just like a stack effect would. House depressurization is part of that uh, combustion safety with natural draft appliances. And um, this test is typically done if you're doing weatherization work before and after. Um, um, before and after you do weatherization work, you want to check for spillage to make sure that, that it's drafting properly before you make the house more airtight. And it also gives you an indicator of how much leeway you have um, of tightening up the house before you start running into problems. So it's good practice to do this before and after um, weatherization 
uh, work, air sealing work on a house. So the first step is you'll set up the house and blow out our test conditions. And we're gonna be measuring the comb combustion appliance zone, the zone, the room, uh, the room that the natural draft furnace or water heater are in uh, with reference to the outside. So left side is the combustion appliance zone, right side is the outside. So run a tube to the outdoors. And we'll want to first write down a baseline number um, because we're, what we're interested in is the change in pressure caused by, by these three different steps we're going to go through. In the first step is to turn on all the exhaust devices. So the, the um, kitchen fan, bath fan, clothes dryer, turn on anything that's going to change the pressure in the house like that, any exhaust device, and, um, and write down that number and compare that to the baseline. So you see how much turning on those fans affected it. And, and we're breaking it out in three steps to help you um, troubleshoot it to see which, which of these three steps has the biggest effect as we're, uh, as we're turning them on. Next step is turn on the air handler and write down that number. The third is, write, is um, set up door positions uh, to worst case. And, and typically you'll be following a protocol on, on how you would do that. So you'll set up those doors in, in a worst case scenario and then write down those numbers. And then compare those worst case pressure numbers with, with allowable limits in your program. And again, this, this again is not a pass-fail criteria. You're still going to check for combustion spillage to see if it, um, if it spills. But, but this gives you targets to work with um, so you know if you're going to tighten up the house, if you're going to start getting towards the edge of what those recommendations are. This application is measuring static pressures in an HVAC system. And we can think of, of measuring static pressures as a way to check the health of the HVAC system, like measuring blood pressure. To understand the health of the system, we'll need to know what these number, what the numbers to look for, what these numbers mean. On the right side here is a, a static pressure probe, and you want that probe to point into the direction where the airflow is coming from. Um, so then we're measuring, measuring static pressure. Um, this chart of is a, is a budget of, of, uh, uh, of what pressures you should expect uh, put out by the National Comfort Institute. So the, the first one on the list is the, mac, is the total external static pressure. And, and that's the pressure, you can think of that as being the pressure across the air handler fan. So you're measuring the, the um, return side right, right uh, on the, the fan side of the filter and you're measuring the pressure underneath the air conditioning coil, so between the fan and the, and the air conditioning coil. So that's the maximum pressure of the system. Um, and then the other four things listed below will add up to that. So we've got one column is inches of water column, which, which a lot of HVAC contractors are used to, and, and then the, the next column is, is the same reading in Pascal's. So the maximum external static pressure should be listed on, on the air handler, on, on the nameplate where you see the, the, the serial number and the, the model number and the BTU input. Um, that will, it should have listed the maximum external static pressure. And a typical one is 0.5 inches or 125 pascals. Um, some will be higher at 0.7 or 0.8, but 0.5 is typical. So the return side has a budget of 25 pascals. So you should be 25 pascals or less um, on, on the return side. So that's uh, before the filter, when you're measuring uh, away from the fan, away on the, on the ductwork side of the filter. The next one is the, the pressure drop across the filter. And that again should be about 25 pascals. The biggest pressure drop you'll see is, is typically the air conditioner coil, the pressure across that, and, and that allows 0.2 or 50 pascals. And then the pressure in the supply duct above the air conditioner coil is allowed 25 pascals. So the ma maximum external static pressure, we can measure that in, in one of two ways. If we've got one static pressure probe, 
we're going to take two pressures and measure the difference between them. And we're going to we're going to run the hose to the to the uh, to the plus side of the gauge or the the input side on the left side of the gauge. So we're going to connect the tube whenever we want to measure what is that pressure. If we connect it to the other side, we're going to get 48 again, but it'll be a positive 48 instead of a negative 48. And it, um, since we're measuring the return side, we know it's going to be a negative 48. So we go, go to the input side, it'll read negative 48. And our budget is um, 125 pascals for the, for the uh, total external static pressure. So if you, if you just have one probe, the next step is, is measure the pressure between the fan and the air conditioner coil. And you want to make sure you're between the fan and the air conditioner coil. Sometimes you won't be. Um, so you want to you wanna make sure that, that it, you're actually measuring the pressure. Just measuring a pressure at the bottom of the plenum isn't, isn't always going um, to be between the fan and the air conditioner coil. So in this case, we're measuring uh, 97 pascals, and then we're going we're gonna to need to measure the difference between these. So 97 minus a negative 48 is, uh, is what we'll be, we'll be measuring. An easy way to do that, if you have two static pressure probes, is just connect a static pressure probe to both, and it'll, calculate, it'll do the math for you and calculate the difference between those. Um, so in this case, it's 145 pascals difference between those two, and our, our budget is, is 125, so we're, we're over that. So if we're sealing ductwork and we're doing this check before we, we start sealing, we're already at too high of a pressure, and it's going to get much higher when we do the duct sealing. So now we've got to troubleshoot and figure out how we can solve that. So we can think of, of this when we're looking at the difference between these two numbers is we have to go to get to zero, we have to go from 97 down to zero, and then we've got to go another 48 to get to um, what our maximum external static pressure is of one, 145. Okay, measuring on the, on the return side before the, the filter slot. So we've got our return ductwork here. We want to measure before the filter slot. And we've got, um, uh, we're measuring negative 28 pascals, or, or, and our budget is, is 25, so um, is negative 25. So we're, we're over a little bit on the return side. Then we want to measure the pressure drop across the filter. So we're going to look at the, the difference between negative 28 and our measurement above the filter, which is negative 48 in this case. So we've moved the two. Uh, we've got a negative 48 at that at that spot, and if we connect two tubes, it's going to do the math for us and calculate the pressure drop of, of 20 pascals. Um, if we've got a, a one-inch pleated filter, those are going to be more restrictive, and and maybe the solution is to uh, um, to put a less restrictive pleated filter or or just a standard filter in there, or a wider filter. Um, certainly wider filters, you're going to have much less uh, a drop, like a four-inch filter. Um, and dirty filters certainly will cause high, higher static pressures also. So putting a clean filter in there will help lower that. But we're at, we're at negative 20, and our budget is at 25. But, but this is a way where we could, we could uh, probably drop it to less than 20 pretty easily by putting in a rest, less restrictive filter. Next step is the pressure drop across the air conditioner coil. So we're going to measure below the coil um, at the location where we were measuring the external static pressure. So we had negative 97 at that location. Next we'll measure above the air conditioning coil and we're seeing we're getting uh, 40 pascals uh, up there. So that we can calculate, do the math and calculate the difference between those two or we can connect uh, both tubes and we'll see we're at a pressure difference between those two locations at negative 57 pascals. And our budget is, is uh, 50 pascals. And for sure, if you have more than 75 at that location, you're gonna wanna check the coil and, and clean it. Um, that, that's gonna be the solution uh, if that's the case. 
uh, but we're we're pretty close to our to our target to our budget. Um, next is the supply duct side, and and we've got forty pascals at that location. Next is the pressure at the supply duct, and that's measuring above the air conditioning coil, and and we've got. 40 pascals at that location, and our budget is 25. So some things we can do to, um, to solve that is either put in larger ductwork or add additional supply registers to, um, to lower that pressure. In this application, we're going to be measuring zonal pressures or zone pressure diagnostics. And with this, we're going to be measuring the change in pascals or the change in pressure to an unconditioned space. And we're doing that to determine if that space is more inside or outside. Is the pressure boundary where it should be? And um, what we're going to determine is a ratio of house to zone to zoned outside leakage. And I'll go into that in more detail, but that's really what zone pressure diagnostics is measuring. And we're going to use a add a hole or open a door method. In this case, we'll use the add a door method to calculate the amount of leakage between that zone um, during a blower dart test. And we're not going into a lot of in-depth details. Uh, we're um, you know that would <laughs> that would take a half a day, but we're just giving you kind of the basics so you can you can understand um, what we're doing with zone pressure diagnostics. So um, in this case, we're, we're bringing the house up to, to 50 pascals, and we're measuring the pressure in the attic. And we're measuring the attic with reference to the house. So the attic is on the left, so the tube goes on the left side. If, uh, so some basics about pressure measurements. We have to think about, about what would, we would expect that pressure to be. And in this case, um, we know we're depressurizing the house, so the airflow is from the attic into the house, and air flows from high pressure to low pressure. So we would expect a positive number in that attic and a negative number in the house. So we're measuring the attic pressure, so we're measuring a positive pressure, and we're at 25 pascals. So what does that 25 tell us? Is that a good number? Is that a bad number? What does that mean? So 25 is telling us that the, the size of the leaks between the house and the attic is the same as the size of the leaks between the attic and the outside. That's what a 25 means. We would like that number to be somewhere around 48, 47, 48, 49. Uh, 50 would be perfect, and that would mean our, our pressure boundary and our thermal boundary are aligned, and they're at this location. Right now, it, it's that um, attic space is halfway between inside and outside. So um, this is kind of reinforcing that idea. So the size of the whole house to attic is the same as the size of the whole attic to outside. It doesn't tell us anything about the size of that hole. That hole could be small. It could be very large. It's just telling us that the ratio of those leaks are the same. And so this chart gives us a little more information. Again, um, the ratio of the size to leaks. So if we're, if we're measuring a house to zone number of 48, um, that's telling us that, that the zone to house is about one eighth the size of, of um, the leaks to the outside. So this is showing us that concept. We're measuring a 48. Now we've got much smaller leak house to zone than zoned outside, and that's where we want it to be. We want our pressure boundary um, to be at, at that location. But you'll notice that, you know, if you look at the size of this hole compared to the size of this hole, we're reading a 25, and we're getting the same size hole house to attic as with a 48. So again, it's not telling us anything about the size of the hole, just the ratio. So now we'll do, do some advanced zone pressure diagnostics. We want to record the, the pressure in the house and, and the airflow, the, the CFM at 50 pascals, and the pressure in the attic. And then we're going to open the hatch and record those numbers again. So the pressure in the house, 
the CFM flow with the attic hatch open, and the new attic pressure. And then we're going to enter that information in software to determine what our, um, how much potential we have if we, if we do a perfect job of air sealing. So we're at, um, we enter all of our information, so our CFM before we added the hole, 3595, the house to zone pressure was 42. Uh, after we open the hole, we're at 5360. Our house to zone is at 13. And now that will do the calculation. And we can see that our new, our, our maximum reduction is over a thousand CFM. So there's a lot of potential. We start out with a 46 number, which if you just take that in its own context, looks like, well, well, that's not too bad. The pressure boundary and thermal boundary are lining up pretty well. But we've got a thousand CFM potential of air sealing in that house. So, um, so no, it's, <laughs> well, we didn't do a good job of air sealing by getting a 46. In this case, we've got a lot of potential. So what do the numbers mean on this chart? Um, there's a certain amount of uncertainty in, in these zone pressure diagnostic numbers. And if we're in the, in the yellow zone, um, we, we've got an uncertainty of 10%. Uh, in the purple, 15%, and so on. In, in our case, we started out at 42, and we moved across to, to 13. So we're, we're kind of solidly in the, in the uncertainty of 15%, which, which is good, um, but we're still, we've still got some uncertainty in, in our numbers. Um, if, if we've got a windy day or a day where we've got a big temper temperature differential between inside and outside, so high high baseline readings. We're going to want to um, do baseline adjusted zone pressure numbers, and, and that's easy with a with a with a DG8 when we're connected with Bluetooth to our TEC gauge app, because we can do a baseline. We we can baseline that gauge. Um, at the same time, we're baselining the blower door number, and, and we'll get a baseline adjusted zonal number. And that, that's important um, to get our proper numbers. If we have a baseline of five, you know, we could be off by five pascals with our zonal number. So we want to make sure and, and do our baseline. The next application is pressure pan measurements. And using the pressure pan, um, works best to find leaks after a, a duct leakage to outside test has been completed. And, and now you know you've got a lot of duct leaks. And you're using the pressure pan to try to find where the leaks are. The, the um, um, duct leakage test doesn't tell you that, but the pressure pan test will. So you want to connect up the pressure pan. You're, you're measuring pressure pan with reference to the room. So, so you want to hook the pressure pan up on the left side of the gauge. Um, it's, it's really a, um, um, a quick and easy way to determine which branch has the biggest leak to the outside. So you bring the blower door out of 50 pascals, put the pressure pan over one register at a time, and, uh, and write down the results. So, so you're not sealing registers, you're just pushing, putting the pressure pan over one register at a time and getting the results. And the highest number is a register closest to the biggest leak. Um, so when you're taking measurements, you want to uh, set up the house and blow it or test conditions. Uh, remove all the furnace filters. Make sure registers are open, or you're going to get you're going to get different numbers with registers open or closed. Um, and make sure the air handler will stay off during the test. And bring the house. You can either um, depressurize or pressurize the house. It, it will work either way. And um, after you, you do your pressure pan readings, you're going to want to measure um, zonal pressures to any attic or crawl space you're working in. And, and you'll need to adjust your readings based on that. So now you, you might be, have some ducts in the crawl space, some in the attic, and you're going to have to adjust your readings based on the pressures. And uh, for example, if the, um, the house is at 50, the zonal pressure is 25, you'll need to double those, those pressure pan readings in that space. Um, 
For larger grills, the, the standard pressure pan is 12 by 14. If, if, you're, if you've got larger return grills, um, we do have a larger pressure pan at 24 by 24, or you can just tape off that, um, that larger register and, and stick the tube through it. And that's, you're essentially doing the same thing as taking a pressure pan reading. It takes a little bit more time, but, but it's essentially the same reading. Um, if you notice there's, there's large gaps around, around the boots, um, the, you know, the boot to floor connection or the boot to, boot to ceiling connection, um, you're going to want to tape off, um, tape off those gaps and retest. So then you get a better sense of, of, uh, how much uh, duct leakage there are. It's, it's easy to seal, to find and seal gaps around boots. It's, it's much more difficult to, to find and seal um, leaks in duct work. So um, it, it's best to get that out of the way and, and focus on where the leaks are in the ducts. This application is our exhaust fan flow meter. And as the name implies, it's for measuring exhaust fan flow. It will not work for measuring supply register flow. And we'll want to be measuring the flow meter with reference to the room. So the tubing will be connected on the left side and we'll connect that to the tap on the exhaust fan flow meter. And then we'll turn on the exhaust fan and cover the exhaust fan with the flow box. And, and the last step is to adjust that so the pressure in that box is between one and eight to get the most accurate readings. So as we saw, the pressure tap is on the upper left. Um, there's Velcro on the box, so the, the handle will stick to it. And there's a short adjustable handle and it's got a, a receiver end on it for a uh, paint roller extension or a broom handle, um, that kind of an extension. And a lot of times at a paint supply store, they'll have an adjustable handle you could you could also purchase for it also. Um, it has an adjustable door with three settings and a rubber gasket uh, to make a tight seal against, uh, against the ceiling and a conversion chart on the side to convert pressure to flow. And uh, setting number one will be for 44 to 124 CFM. Setting 2 for 21 to 59 CFM, and setting 3 for 10 to 28 CFM. And you can see there's overlap between each of those. And I, I would recommend setting number 2. I think most of the fans will fall in, in that range. That's a good starting point. And if, if the pressure is too high, you'll want to make the opening larger to drop that pressure. If the pressure yeah, and by too high, I mean over eight pascals. So if we have it set that it's ring, ring setting number two, and the pressure is over eight pascals, you want to make the opening bigger to drop that pressure. If if you have it set to number two and the pressure is below one pascal, then you'll want to uh, close that door more, make the opening smaller to increase the pressure. So this is what the chart looks like on the side of the uh, the meter, and we'll we'll find the pressure. We had we had uh, 5.8 pascals, so so we'll go down the pressure chart, find 5.8 pascals, and then move across. And we had it set to E2, so we'll use the E2 column and follow that down, and that's saying our flow is 50 cfm. The next application is measuring pressures underneath a concrete slab. And, and that's done to assure that harmful gases such as radon aren't coming into your house. If you have your radon tested and the levels are high, then the first step is to seal the floor and the walls and any cracks between the house and, and the soil and have the radon retested. If you find the radon levels are still high in the house, you'll have to have a radon system installed. And that system consists of a, a radon fan, an inline fan installed in an attic or somewhere outside the pressure boundary of the house that can vent that radon to the outside. And, and that pipe will extend down below the concrete slab and they'll create a space where it can draw air from. 
And um, they'll also want to make sure by measuring pressures underneath the slab that that is getting suction under all parts of the house. So the way they'll do that is to drill a hole through through the concrete floor in different locations uh, around the um, uh, around the house, and then take a measurement of the house with respect to with reference to the space underneath the slab. So you drill a hole, stick a tube in that hole, and measure that pressure. And you want to see a positive pressure. So you're you're noticing uh, you'll notice that we're measuring house with respect to outside, you know, with respect to the space underneath the, the, um, the slab, um, like we would with a blower door test. But in this case, we want to see a positive pressure. We want the pressure to, um, to drive airflow from the house to the outside, in this case, um, to make sure that, you know, if the flow is the other direction, then those harmful gases could come in um, through those cracks. So remember, we need a driving force and a hole for there to be airflow. Uh, and in this case, we want the airflow to be down and, and not up. Um, so after done, you know, drilling all those holes and measuring all those pressures to make sure we have that pressure field extension under the whole home, um, then we'll want to uh, make sure the fan, you know, is not only has enough pressure at all of those points, but but that there's enough airflow also. And the airflow is determined by measuring the pressure across the fan and, and comparing that with the, with the fan curve chart and, uh, and you can determine flow that way. Okay, thanks Paul. Now I'm gonna close up the presentation uh, with just a couple of slides to um, answer some common questions that we anticipate on the DG8, but then we will be opening it up for your questions. The first one is who's in, you know, who's the intended user for a DG8 and weatherization, home performance, HVAC techs, radon inspectors, energy raters. Uh, you know, there's probably situations where this could be a very effective gauge for you for many of the measurements that you might make. Uh, and hopefully Paul gave you an idea of those applications. Um, we created it because we, we know that there are applications where you need the accuracy of a blower door style micro manometer, um, but those are very expensive because of all the capability that they have. And this gauge is intended to give you that accuracy at a much lower price point. Um, we've already talked about the Bluetooth communication and uh, the color display and today it connects with the Tech Gauge app. Um, when is, will it be available? It's available now. So you can order this um, directly from us at our main line or at info at energyconservatory.com. But if you're used to working with one of our distribution partners, you very likely can order it through them as of today as well. <clears throat> uh, the list price for the product, as I said, is $549 US. And if you're looking for more information, you can visit our website at energyconservatory.com. And there you'll find some more detailed specifications and you can also download the overview brochure. Uh, last slide before we open it up for questions, just a quick um, update and uh, other items that are coming up for us in the near future. Um, the next webinar we're doing is a co-sponsored with ResNet. It's on November 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central. And this is on duct leakage testing, and Paul will be giving this presentation. Uh, and we're doing this with ResNet because there's really now, uh, in addition to ResNet 380, there's the new ResNet ACA 310 standard about grading um, HVAC installations. And a key part of that grading is doing the duct leakage testing consistent with like a ResNet 380 as well. So we'll be going through that. Um, and then uh, the other big news item that we want to let you know about is we do have an online training portal available now. So this is online equipment training. Uh, if you have a Minneapolis blower door or a Minneapolis duct blaster doing envelope or duct leakage testing, this gives you sort of a step-by-step -step modularized training with quizzes. So each section or chapter of the training 
uh, it takes five to 12 minutes. And then there's a short quiz to make sure that you got the key points. If you complete the course and all the quizzes, you will get a certificate uh, of training um, that says you've gone through our equipment training. Uh, you can get a link to that right on our website and, and uh, click on the training menu. This is what it looks like. You'll log in, you'll create your own login. And when you've completed the courses successfully, you'll get this certificate, which will uh, be available. So that's really the big things that are coming up. And that closes out our webinar, but now we'll open it up and take any questions you might have. Thanks for joining today. So um, we'll just step through. There were a few questions that were out there. Um, you know, several of them have been answered online uh, in, the, in the panel, but some really good suggestions about how, how might we do a belt clip or some kind of magnetized option for carrying it around. Very good ideas. You know, one of the things that you should know about, uh, about this product is it might not have come through, but it is so small that this thing will fit in your pocket quite easily, whether it's your shirt pocket or pants pocket, but certainly understand the suggestions uh, about maybe a belt clip or something like that being uh, useful. So thanks for that. Um, there's a question that's open about what about Europe? And that's a great question. Um, so certainly the, the, uh, the product is available to Europeans, but we do not yet have our CE approval. So there's nothing in the design we're concerned about meeting, but we haven't um, finished all of the testing required to get the official uh, approval on that. So that is something uh, to highlight. Um, but we do expect to have that at some point in the near future. Uh, there's another question that's come through. What is the cost of the certificate training? And so um, there's, a, there's currently no cost. It's free. If you go to our uh, um, uh, main page and click on the training menu, you will find a link to this portal where you can create an account today for free that will last for 30 days so that you can get a, a view of what this training material is like. In the future, it will have a list price of $150 US, but that will be um, counted towards the purchase of new equipment or when you purchase new equipment, it will be included with the purchase to ensure that we're helping everyone who buys this equipment know how to use it. Um, and then I see that there is a, another question uh, about the advantages of using the pressure pan over the duct blaster. And Steve, I guess you're gonna take this one, is that right? Yeah, I want to make sure I understand the question correctly. I, I, th I think that the answer you're looking for is the duct blaster is going to tell you how much leakage there is. The pressure pan can help you find where it's leaking. Uh, if you're doing a, uh, a duct leakage to outside test, you will be able to, uh, you know, if you put the pressure pan on each register, as Paul explained, the, the largest pressure will tell you where the biggest leak is. And if you just keep repeating that process, you should be able to um, find more and more leaks and reduce the duct leakage little by little. So I, I hope that's the answer that we're looking for. Okay. Um, I'm wondering, you know, it's a little bit of my, <laughs> maybe I'm learning. I'm not sure if there's a way I can unmute um, others, but if you raise your hand, uh, I do believe I can, can uh, unmute individuals. So if anybody has another question, you can either enter it in to the uh, Q&A box or raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Okay. So what I'm gonna do while we're just seeing if there's anyone else, I'm going to go out to our website and uh, I'm just going to show you where if you have any, uh, you know, if you're looking for additional information, you can see now here's the DG8. Today's session was all about just getting, uh, getting the thoughts going, eight applications for the DG8, but there's certainly more applications where you might use it. And hopefully, uh, Paul went through a very high, fast paced review, but there's a lot of content. If you come out to our site under support, 
and applications about really the details of making these measurements. If you saw some that maybe you're not uh, not an expert at today, but what we're interested in, um, you can find that information here. If you click on the DG uh, the DG8, you're going to find more information about it here and some links where you can download the Tech Gauge app to make sure that you have that and uh, any other comparisons. As I said, it's available today from us. It's available today, really, uh, if you're used to working with a distribution partner of ours, um, they will be able to take the order uh, without a doubt and we'll be shipping out to everyone starting on Monday. Uh, so um, really available through our network and direct starting uh, whenever you're ready <laughs> and we're pretty excited about it. I'm not seeing any other questions. Is anyone else seeing any? Um, there is one on the, the min-max uh, pressures that you can measure. Oh, okay. Um, and I think that's 10 inches of water column, right? 1250. For max, yep. Yep, that's right. Or uh, 2500 that would be. 2500. I think Ask. maybe the question relates to a feature for keeping track of min max over a time interval, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay. Yeah, Eric says correct. So, so um, Steve or Colin or Paul, can you guys answer that one? Not available at this time. That, that's something, a feature we could add in the future, likely with our Tech Gauge app. Uh, and I see that Luis um, Lianes has his uh, raised his hand, but uh, can you are you able to unmute him, Bill? Yeah, I'll thank you for letting me know. Uh, there he is. So Luis, you should be invited to unmute and you should be able to talk. Can you hear us, Luis? I have un I have unmuted you, but maybe it's not working. Okay. All right. Well, I think if there's no other questions. Oh, there's one more question just showed up from Luis. Is it true that the DG1000 is in back order? Not that I'm aware of. No, that's available and. Uh, Ready to go. Yeah, Luis, I'm, uh, we should, uh, I'm going to put back up. You should send us a, an email on what you're seeing, but yeah, that's available. You should be able to find that. Um, we definitely have them in inventory. And I imagine that uh, a few of our distribution partners uh, ha probably have them in stock as well. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining. <laughs>